So, um, well, I want to um, really warmly welcome you all to the London Buddhist Centre for this year's Rambles, Sabuti's Rambles. Uh, my name is Suri Gupta and uh, I'm the chair of the London Buddhist Centre. So, yeah, warmly welcome you uh, online as well and also if you're listening to watching this on the replay too. Um, yeah, it's a great pleasure of mine to introduce you, Sabuti. To, the, uh, to us today um, and to the LBC. Um, uh, yes, you know, if you know uh, the LBC, you know that every year Sabuti comes once or twice a year, often twice a year. Uh, and always, twice a always, year. Twice a year. <laughs> always twice a year. Always twice a year. I could, I could question that a little bit, but mostly <laughs> twice a year. <laughs> We're not going to start off arguing, are we? <laughs> <laughs> That'll come later. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so he comes twice a year <laughs> um, to the London Buddhist Centre uh, as our president. And, um, you know, a president is someone who is really a friend to the centre, a spiritual friend, a Dharma friend, and uh, really there to encourage us, inspire us, guides us, gives us perspective, and where needed, challenges us as well. Um, and Sabuti does this by meeting up with lots of people who come along, meets up with the team here, meets up with our council, our board, meets up with really uh, anyone who's connected to a centre who wants to engage. Um, and he does that really very generously. Um, and you always know when uh, Sabuti is visiting really because there's a sort of intensification, uh, really, an intensification of communication. Uh, of connection, uh, a lot of energy is produced, um, and it's not just with Sabuti actually, it just happens with all of us are, that are in engaged. Somehow your, his presence really brings, um, really brings focus and depth and energy, and he does that through um, leading events like this, as I said, meeting up with one on one, small study groups, lots of different ways. So I really uh, appreciate. Um, uh, Sabuti's visits, they really, the development of the centre really, I would say, is inextricably linked with uh, your, your visits. Uh, they always have an effect uh, on us, a positive effect, gives us direction. Um, so I'm really delighted you're here again mm -hmm. with us. And um, yeah, as I said, as it's a, he's coming as a friend. He's not uh, paid to do this. There's no contract or anything like that. He just <laughs> comes. <laughs> Because he loves the LBC, uh, he loves the Dharma, um, he's passionate about helping all of us. And your, uh, he's passionate about his own practice and helping all of us go deeper with our understanding of the Dharma so we can have an effect in our own lives and in the world. So really as a friend. Um, and uh, yeah, we show our appreciation just by coming along and listening, engaging, um, but also, you know, practically as well. So there is uh, a Dana bowl out there. Dana bowls just if you, you know, want to give, please do. Uh, it goes to Sabuti just to help fund, you know, his visits uh, to us. Um, but really, yeah, it's really helping us to go deeper with our understanding so we can live as sort of fully, really, as Sabuti manages to do and communicate as fully with each other. So today and the next two days, uh, Sabuti is going to be talking about uh, the mind, the nature of the mind. And when I say mind, I mean the thinking mind, the mind that perceives, the mind that constructs, but also the heart, the feeling, uh, emotions. Mind and heart are not separated in Buddhism. So he's going to be talking, rambling uh, around mind and... Um, yeah, I, I'm really interested to hear what you've got to say. If you know Sabuti, that in a way actually has been his topic for years, really. Because the mind, well, the world is created by mind. Our lives, the uh, way we live our lives through the way we perceive, the way we interact. So I'm really interested to hear what Sabuti's got to say. And also looking to see what I'm going to take away, what we're going to take away around not just our own lives and not just ourselves as a community, but the world we're in right now the world uh, post-pandemic, the world um, or coming out of pandemic, uh, hopefully, and the world that's in Europe that's at war, the world that's actually in many ways uh, 
on fire as well. So I'm kind of uh, very keen to hear what Sabuti you got to say uh, to us today. So welcome Sabuti. <laughs> Thank you very much, as always, Surya Gupta. One of the great delights for me is that I spend a lot of time with the chair, and we we don't we 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 ramble around quite a bit, <laughs> but uh, it's a great delight. It, I suppose one of the things that draws me here is friendships. That I have a lot of friends, and I'm always making new friends each time I come. So it's a great delight to me to uh, further those friendships. I recently was interviewed by Maitre Bandhu, who many of you know lives upstairs and has been a prominent teacher here, uh, on the subject of the nature of mind for what is known as the Nature of Mind Project, which is run from Adishthana, quite closely connected with the LBC, uh, Adishthana being uh, the, 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 the headquarters of the Public Preceptors College in Herefordshire. And uh, in the course of this, well, we had an hour to talk about mind, from my perspective. And later, I, I heard that he'd suggested that I amplified what I'd been saying in, in that interview. There was a lot that I didn't say. <laughs> this certainly is, because in the end, the mind is all. That's fundamental Buddhist teaching. Everything emerges from the mind, Everything is led by mind, and so on. The very first uh, two verses of the Dhammapada. Uh, whatever uh, arises, arises from the mind. So, uh, yes, I want to approach it by talking about three different ways of looking at the mind in the Buddhist tradition. I'm going to talk today about the most basic teaching, uh, the one that we most characteristically find in the the suttas, the discourses, that are the most closely attributable to the Buddha himself. So the, the teachings that he himself gave about the mind. I'm not going to make precise what I mean by the mind yet. Then tomorrow I'm going to talk about what happens when we begin to see the mind in its depth, when we begin to be a bit free from or our delusion. What's the mind like then? We're going to be looking at the mind as uh, opening up to others, as being full of compassion, as naturally full of compassion. And then on the final day, we're going to be looking at the, the fundamental nature of mind. And uh, you'll find, I hope, that there's a thread running through the, all of these themes, uh, because really there's not different teachings the different slices through the same fundamental uh, uh, business. So Buddhism is radically non-theoretical, probably to a degree that we don't realize. The Buddha uh, launched a great protest against theorizing. Uh, uh, we're told that uh, Buddhism at, at uh, uh, the time of his mission uh, sorry, that the India at the time of his mission was full of speculative uh, ideas, that many people had left home, were wandering in the jungles, wandering in the forests, and they were speculating. What is the nature of things? What is the nature of the self? What is the nature of suffering? Uh, what is the nature of this world? But uh, the speculation was very theoretical, and... Uh, uh, it was, it was, of course, it was accompanied by meditation and so forth, but it's as if the theory formed the meditative experience. We're told that the Buddha himself, uh, after he'd gone forth from, uh, from his home, he looked for teachers, and he found teachers who taught a theoretical perspective on existence, and they showed ways to achieve uh, a realisation of that theoretical exp uh, uh, um, uh, uh, expression. But the Buddha realised he did achieve what they taught him. He did uh, follow the path that they set out for him. And he realised that it's not enough. Just having an idea about things 
and getting a clear grasp of the idea about things doesn't resolve the fundamental problem of suffering. It doesn't liberate you because you're just living in an idea. Uh, and that idea is always going to be somewhat discordant. It's never going to fit reality. Uh, ideas are uh, a step away from direct experience. They're very, very valuable. It's important that we think. It's important that we even theorise at times. But theory is not reality. The map is not the countryside. So uh, it's not enough to, to have a good map uh, and think that by having that good map, you've got reality. So the Buddha was radically against that. And uh, um, the scholars say that this was uh, very, very distinctive, very unusual, very rare. So the whole of his teaching is a protest, if you like, against theorizing, mere theorizing. That does not mean that there are not lots of ideas in Buddhism. Otherwise, what on earth am I going to talk about? There are lots of ideas in Buddhism, but those ideas, if you can really call them that, are ways of directing us back to our own experience. They're ways of helping us to look at our own experience and understand it better. I was thinking when I was uh, wondering how enough I was going to fill this hour, I was thinking <laughs> about um, uh, the, the, the role of the critic, the literary critic or the art critic. Um, and again, a thought came into my mind. I, last year I read again War and Peace, which should be read every year by everybody, is, <laughs> to my mind, the greatest novel of all. Thereby I've shamed half of you because you've never read it. <laughs> but uh, joking apart, it, it's a wonderful novel. It is just a wonderful read in itself. It just reads so engagingly. But his ability to see deeply into character, his understanding of, of human interaction, and his vast perspective on geopolitical forces... So I reread it, and at the same time I was reading a, a book that was intended as a sort of companion to uh, Russian literature and culture generally. And, uh, by the way, if anybody's interested, it's called Natasha's Dance by Orlando Figes. It's a very, very good book indeed. And as a result of reading it, War and Peace went into, th well, another dimension, four dimensions, if you like. I understood better what the novel was about. Not that I carried a theory from his writing, but because of the way he was, uh, was exploring Russian culture, I could understand far better what was going on in the novel. So you find that with the best critics. Some critics just tell you what to think. But really good critics tell you how to look or see or, or, or hear uh, or... Um, uh, 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 you know, take in. You know, a really good music critic tells you where to put your ear. You know, I remember um, somebody saying uh, about listening to, to Indian classical music, listen to the tabla. If you put your ear on the tabla, everything comes into shape. And then I find that with, for instance, uh, a composer like Bach. Listen to the ground, listen to the, the, the bass. Um, and then everything else fits into place. And it's the same with every, everything. I, I, I remember uh, with, with, with some gypsy friends listening to some music, and they were educating me in how to listen to the music. Before that, I'd enjoyed the rhythm and the energy of it, but you show me the subtleties of it, the way in which they harmonised, the way they, they supported each other. And it's not that they're telling you a piece of information that you then sort of uh, impose on it, is a piece of uh, a perspective that then shows you where to look. So that's the nature of Buddhist uh, teaching. It shows you how to look at your own experience. It doesn't tell you what your experience is. In the end, it always has to come back and you have to be able to say, hmm, ah, I see that, I understand that, or I don't see that in which case you might choose some other perspective or uh, maybe try to understand better what's being said. So it's very, very important, especially when we're talking about mind, because uh, mind is, uh, by definition, indefinable. 
because definition belongs to the objective world, if you see what I mean. We can define what is objective in our experience. Huh? We can define a wall. Uh, we can define uh, relationships and so on to some extent. But to define that which perceives, that which objectifies, makes, uh, makes things aware, brings things into awareness, is very, very difficult indeed. Uh, it's in, in a sense impossible because definition belongs to the, 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 the external world, just time and space. But that which even is doing the defining is sort of outside that. I should, by the way, I just uh, wanted to say something else about war and peace and all that just because it's a bit topical. Um, <laughs> forgive me for jumping back. But I think if you, if, you, if you read War and Peace and if you, if you look at Orlando Fages, his work, you'll understand far better what's going on now. This is not the first time this has happened. It, it's, um, and you understand better how it looks from a Russian perspective. Uh, from the Russian perspective, it feels like encirclement and protect, they're protecting themselves, whatever else is going on. So that's something that the West should have learned by now because they've suffered Napoleon, they've suffered Hitler, and they think it's happening again. So it's important that we understand the, 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 the richness, the fullness of things. So again, reading a book like that enlarges your perspective on what's happening now. Okay? Uh, in, uh, historical, uh, geopolitical comment over. <laughs> Back to the nature of mind. <laughs> I want to advertise that because I think that the, the Western press is just so one-sided in its approach. It does not appreciate how we contributed to this. We contributed to this. Anyway, not to say that there's any excuse for invading another country. Uh, so, um, that cuts many ways. Shut up, get on with it. Uh, mind. <laughs> mind itself. Um, yeah, mind is, 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 is by definition indefinable. Uh, it's like the eye cannot see itself. Uh, you can talk about how it sees to some extent, but you can't define the eye from, or, or the seeing, uh, if you see what I mean. Don't think about that too much, because you'll find I'm not quite right. But you get the illustration as a metaphor. So... Uh, uh, when we're talking about mind, we always have to be trying to reach into our experience of it, uh, of, uh, of being aware. Mind, the, the phrase mind is very, very elastic. It doesn't, uh, it's not very precise at all. And uh, probably when even just saying the word mind, everybody has got a rather fuzzy sort of range of, of uh, references for it. Uh, you, you, mind can refer to the, the sort of mechanism, the mental processes, stimulus, response, perception, uh, thinking, um, feeling. The whole range is all encompassed by whatever is not to do with uh, 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 the world outside. Could somebody get a chair for Jana? Thank you. So, very nice to see you, Jana. Thank you. <laughs> that's good, that's why you've come. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, um, you, you might be thinking, it, 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 mind can encompass all those mental processes. But what I think we're, we're most going to be talking about is more awareness itself, the act of being aware. Uh, we say awareness, and of course, as soon as you put ness on the end of a word, it turns it into something abstract, and it seems as if it's a thing. But awareness is simply a word for a continuous arising of moments of awareness, of being aware. It's more of a verb than a noun, if you see what I mean. It, it's not a thing, it's, a, it's an activity. Uh, it, 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 it gets nearer to what it is. So we're going to be trying to see what awareness is. And uh, we'll start with the, the earliest phase of Buddhism, uh, the, the, the phase that's represented by the suttas, that is so usually 
uh, uh, translated as discourses of the Pali Canon. Uh, these uh, record as, as near as possible what the Buddha himself actually said. We know they're not directly you know, tape recordings of the Buddha's words, and we know that even the Buddha wouldn't have used quite that language, but uh, it's um, fairly clearly, and we've got ways of seeing that it must be so, they're fairly clearly getting us quite close to the Buddha's own voice. Not quite getting there, but getting very close to it, and very obviously a range of what you'll find there is the Buddha's own teaching. So uh, what he has to say about uh, awareness in those early suttas really encompasses mainly sense awareness. Uh, consciousness in those early suttas is mainly to do with sensory awareness, which is quite interesting. There's one famous sutta called the Sabha Sutta. The Sabha means all, still does in, in uh, Marathi today. Uh, Sabha means uh, all or everything, sorry, in, in, in Hindi. Uh, Sarva in, in other languages. So Sabha means all. So it's the, the discourse about everything. And the discourse about everything uh, is basically about the senses. So the Buddha is saying there isn't anything apart from the senses and their objects. There's nothing else. Now, you need to be careful here, he's not a sort of radical materialist because his idea of, of, of the senses encompasses many, many more subtle layers of, of, uh, of sensing. Uh, uh, layers of sensing that are uh, extrasensory, if you like, and indeed the, the notion of, of the senses in, in uh, early Buddhism, in Buddhism generally, encompasses what we call extrasensory. So uh, telepathy, um, etc., etc., all encompassed under the heading of sensing. Uh, to, to, to Buddhism universally, extrasensory perceptions are not at all uh, unnatural or supernatural. They're just um, phenomena that occur under certain particular conditions and under certain uh, uh, phases of, of human development. And there are, according to Buddhist tradition, many, many layers of existence which are much more subtle than this one. There are some that are much less subtle, the hell realms, even the animal realm, and so on. But there are, we, we live in a multi-layered universe, and our senses have, have access, or sensing, has access to all those realms. But for early Buddhism, sensing, in its fullness, as I'm going to explain it, encompasses everything. Everything comes under the heading of uh, 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 consciousness and its objects. Okay? So today we're going to be examining sensing. And let's just pause for a moment to realise that's what we're all doing. Otherwise, nothing's happening. Uh, but we're all of us sensing right now. We're all of us aware of a world out there, of things happening in that world, and of uh, processes going in, on inside us that we're aware of. And uh, this is our world, the world that is revealed by our own senses, in which our own senses uh, take their place. So that's important. Again, refer back to experience. Is that can you know anything outside sensing if you understand sensing in a large enough way, in a subtle enough way? And that's maybe a question you can think about. In the, in the Sabha Sutta, the Buddha said, you cannot find anything that is not encompassed by the senses. And again, the senses in this full, subtle, rich sense. So what the, the, the Buddha says is that uh, the, the, the sensing consists of two different processes, an internal process and an external process. There's a third process we'll come on to in a minute. But there's what, what are known as the six internal sense bases. And then the, the, what are known as the six external sense bases. These are the ayatanas, 
that you come across. For those who know, I'm not going to uh, uh, talk more about it, but for those who know, in the 12 Nidanas, you get Salayatana, and that means the six senses. So that's talking about the internal sense bases. Um, so we've got eye, ear, smell, nose, uh, tongue, taste, uh, body, sensation, uh, physical sensation, and we've got the mind as a sense base. Um, and this is something a bit unusual for us because we usually think of five senses in, in at least the European tradition. We think of five senses. But uh, uh, in, uh, in Buddhist theory, there's a sixth sense which is referred to as the, the mind base. And uh, uh, the mind base encompasses all sorts of extrasensory perception. What, you, what are you doing when you're dreaming? It's the mind base that is coming into operation. What are you doing when you, you know something about what's going on that you don't know through the senses? You know, many people have that sort of intuition. You de definitely know what somebody else is thinking. Believe it or not, I've certainly experienced that myself. You know what's going to happen, those sort of things. Well, that's the mind sense. The mind sense is not pegged by the, the, the limitations of the body. And it, uh, in the case of, of, of somebody highly developed like the Buddha, it becomes very far-ranging indeed. It's not at all limited by physical location or space and time. So that, that, that the mind sense is the, 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 the sense that perceives uh, not through the physical senses. Uh, actually, those physical senses also become more subtle. So there are, uh, in, in, in other realms of existence, it's said, uh, sensory, the sensory experience, which is sort of subtle uh, 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 sight, subtle sound, etc., Mind sense also encompasses the, uh, the assemblage of the other senses into a single experience. In, uh, you know the expression common sense? We use that very wrongly. Uh, common sense is a, um, a medieval scholastic idea, which is of the sense that organises the other senses. So I'm sitting here now, I've got a visual impression of you all. Uh, I can hear mainly the sound of my own voice, as usual. Um, <laughs> I can maybe taste a little something in my mouth. I can yeah, smell the candles burning. Uh, and I can feel the chair underneath me. But they do, don't come to me as sort of s single discrete experiences. I've not got a sight and a sound as sort of separate compartments of experience. Uh, and a, a, a feeling of a chair underneath me is something sort of separate from the sound. They're all assembled into a total experience. Huh? So your, your, um, uh, the, the, the mind sense organises the other five senses into a single experience. So it's very basic. Uh, it's all animals have that capacity to create a single picture. Well, it, uh, I'm speaking analogically. I don't know what on earth goes on in there in their experience, but analogically they clearly do, uh, you know, they, they're aware of a sound which means a threat and an avenue of escape, which they can see. So there's, I live among sheep, so I know a lot about this. Um, so they're terrified all the time, uh, poor creatures. Um, well, with good cause, in the end, it all ends up badly for them. But um, the, the, the mind sense encompasses that that uh, um, co cohering of all the other senses so that we have one experience. When you're sitting in front of a fire, you feel the heat on your, on your legs, you feel the, uh, you hear the crackling, you can smell the smoke, and so on. But it comes as a single assembled experience. You can get experiences of uh, uh, abnormal, uh, abnormal experiences, either through drugs or being very ill, something like that, where they start to separate out. Uh, but normally, we, we assemble them all and, and have them as a whole. So those are the five, six internal sense bases, and they have corresponding to them six external sense bases. So the eye base 
has a, a, a visual object uh, as an, its external correspondent, and so on. And these are talked of as, uh, as codependent. They arise together. So you can't have, in a sense, the eye base without uh, the, the, the sight base out there. Uh, they're not, and they're not totally discrete. Um, they, they, they operate together. It's a very important principle in Buddhism that uh, everything is connected, everything is, belongs in a single uh, field of shared conditionality. So they, they mutually condition each other. The eye sense arises in dependence on the visual image, but the visual image arises in dependence on the eye sense. Okay, so we've got... Uh, inner sense base, external sense base, arising together. When they arise together, they do so in another set of, of six, which is the corresponding consciousnesses or awarenesses. So when I sense comes in contact with visual object, you get eye consciousness, uh, sight consciousness, and so on. So uh, uh, everything emerges in awareness. The two um, sides of uh, uh, the visual experience arise together in awareness. So this, this is a way of looking at what's going on. And just pause for a moment and just sort of explore that a little bit. Just take an object, either uh, by shutting your eyes and listening to the whisper of the uh, air conditioning, for instance, that's a very useful sound in here, uh, and sort of, as best you can, notice the, these three dimensions. Of course, they're so wrapped up together, you can't really separate them out but just sort of notice the, uh, the ear, as it were, the faculty of hearing. It's not really the organ, but the faculty of hearing. And the, uh, the sound and the awareness of them. I don't know what you make of that, but at least you sort of bring your attention to, to that going on and uh, notice those. You, you, you can use the, the tool of that distinction to sort of interrogate what's going on. Notice those three and how inextricably interentwined they are. They arise together. So far, this is all completely innocent. Uh, there's, there's, there's no problem with that. If you just see, uh, just hear, and you're simply aware of what is presenting itself and of the, uh, the faculty that uh, it's presented to, it's completely innocent. Sensing is not a problem. Not a problem. It's just sensing. Uh, whatever arises, arises. You're aware of it. That's it. Trouble is, we don't stay there. That's the problem. The Buddha tells us that we should just try to stay there. There's a very famous story of uh, a, um, a, a wanderer, that is somebody who'd uh, uh, left home to try to discover the truth. He actually came from Western India, from, uh, as said, from a port in Maharashtra, and uh, he was trying to find the solution to things. So he, um, uh, um, uh, he, was, he was called Bahir of the Bark Garment. Apparently he wrote, wore, wore linen robes, one presumes. Uh, so he wasn't, he wasn't willing to use woven things. He would find bark and smash it into a, into a robe. Uh, and um, he heard of the Buddha right the way across on the other side of India and made his way there. Of course, he made his way there in a single night. But take that with as much salt as you want. <laughs> but he found his way to the Buddha, and uh, it, the Buddha was on his arms round. 
And it was the Buddha's custom when he was on the, his arms round not to speak. This was to avoid um, uh, getting, you, you know, trying to get people to give you good good food, as it were. Uh, you kept uh, you kept kept quiet and just stood with your arms bowl. Later, they were allowed to to chant a um, uh, a little saying, uh, but it. You, the, you know, the idea was that you didn't try to seduce people into giving you really good food. You're trying to be completely open to whatever they gave you. So it was the Buddha's custom to remain completely silent on his arms round. So he went around the town, standing at doors, just silently waiting to see whether anybody put something in his bowl. And, uh, but uh, uh, Bahia of the Bark Garment couldn't wait. He, he was in a, in a rush. He really wanted a solution to his problem, the problem of existence. And he, f he, he believed very strongly the Buddha could give him the answer. So he approached the Buddha and asked him uh, um, you know, for a teaching. The Buddha said, it's, this is not the right time. But he wasn't to be stopped. You know the sort of person. Mm -hmm. He wasn't to be stopped. It, I mean, in a way, a good thing. He, he really knew he needed to find out. So he asked him again. Buddha said again, this is not the right time. But he asked a third time. And it was the Buddha's custom that whatever you asked, sometimes to people's dismay, he would answer. There are a few occasions where he presses, people press him to answer. He said, don't ask me, you won't like what I answer. Mm -hmm. uh, but they ask him three times, he said, okay, here it is. <laughs> so anyway, on this occasion, the, the Buddha um, uh, it, uh, is described as giving him an elephant look. Uh, now, anybody, you all know what an elephant looks like, don't you? When an elephant looks at you, it can't look at you out of the corner of its eyes. It has to turn its whole body towards you. And, you, you know, when a, an elephant turns its whole body uh, towards you, there's a whole lot of elephant. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, the Buddha gives an elephant look, so he just turns and gives his whole attention to Bahia, uh, which could um, fry you if you weren't ready for it. But um, yes, he gives, he gives Bahia an elephant look, and he says, in the scene, only the scene. In the herd, only the herd. Then there should be no thereby, thereafter, etc., in other words, just stay with sensing. Just stay with what is immediately presenting itself to you. Don't get involved in what happens after. So, uh, this is where we are. If we could only do that, if we could just stay with our experience, if we need to think, stay with our thinking. Do you see what I mean? Just, we use thinking in order to resolve a, a question or a problem or whatever, as it's needed, but we're then finished with it. We don't just get caught up in endless ratiocination, as so many of us do. So you can't switch off, and you're constantly thinking, constantly working things out. And of course, thinking is underlain by feeling, unresolved feeling, out-of-control feeling. Uh, thinking is never completely abstract, it's always fueled. So we don't stop there. We don't even stop with, with uh, 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 thinking, uh, uh, which is, after all, a, a function of awareness, or function in awareness. We don't just stop with that. We get carried away into a whole mass of uh, uh, activity, which leads to our problems. It's the fact, from early Buddhist point of view, it's the fact that we can't stop here and operate uh, effectively from here that we get involved in a false construction of reality, uh, a mistaken construction of reality, within which we suffer. That's the issue. We suffer when we're not able to just stay here. So uh, what happens is something arises in consciousness. A visual image arises in consciousness as the consequence of the uh, joining together of the, the, the inner base and the outer base in consciousness, there's a visual image. And then we have habitual responses to that, responses that have been set up in the past. 
uh, that have been set up by our behaviour, our activities in the past. Uh, you know, we're most commonly aware of this in terms of prejudices. You know, we, we've already decided that somebody who's like that is like that, if you see what I mean. So it's not that we think about it anymore. It actually arises simultaneously with the image. And uh, it, it also arises in, 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 in relation to things that we like. As soon as something happens that we like, as soon as, you know, a pleasant piece of food is wafted before us, uh, we seize on to its pleasurable aspects. We give it what is called unwise attention, a yoniso manaskara. Manaskara means uh, mind-making, making the mind in relation to something. Uh, a yoniso means uh, not, to relate, not related to what really is. So something arises in front of us, if we just took it in as what arose in front of us, no problem. But what happens is we seize on aspects of it and we distort the image. So we don't see it as it is, we see it uh, in relation to our pre-existing habits and patterns, our habit of craving, our habit of greed, our habit of doubt, our habit of, uh, of, of views. You know, we carry around with us a whole mass of theories and ideas that we're not even aware of. We've inherited them from the culture around us and that then filter what comes to us pure and innocent and we distort it. So then we pay attention to one side of it. So... Uh, 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 unwise attention is where we focus on those aspects of the object or the field of experience that are pleasing to us and ignore those that are unpleasing or those that are problematic. So you see the glass of whiskey and you think of the pleasurable uh, delight of being slightly piddled, um, to use the technical term. And uh, you forget about the, the loss of mindfulness uh, and if, uh, eventually, even if it goes far enough, the, the headache, the hangover, the memory or the dim, distant sense of what stupid things you've done. So you, you, you focus only on what you, you identify that object with, not on its fullness, not on what it really is. I think it's very, very pertinent in relation to uh, human relations. Uh, we carry around with us ideas about each other uh, based on class or race and on just on temperament, colour of hair or whatever it is. We carry around with us those sort of uh, um, uh, prepackaged uh, re responses and instead of addressing the individual who, who is actually in front of us, we address our distorted image of them. which may be partly true in some way or other, uh, what what, what uh, uh, Sangharakshita once said, sort of, uh, um, that people saw him in a certain way, uh, and they're all true, a bit like somebody looking through the wrong end of a telescope. In other words, it, you're distorting what you're looking at, uh, and minimising it, or maximising it, or blanking out part of it, only seeing one side of it. And um, uh, so uh, you you produce a distorted world around you, which is not as it really is. Yoniso. Um, there you are, that's it, pretty much. That's, the, that's it, that's the all. Um, that the senses uh, provide us uh, with, at the, in the first instant, just what is. It's not, it's pure, it's un unadulterated, it's, it's whole, it's um, um, unquestionable. It just is what it is. And uh, it's nothing more than what appears. Because even when we start to interpret it as being this or that or the other, we're already moving away from what appears. So, uh, yes, our senses deliver us at the first instance absolutely pure moment of consciousness, uh, a pure moment of awareness, a primary awareness, this is known of in, in later tradition, the primary mind sees things absolutely clear and pure.
but it hardly has a moment to operate. Uh, in fact, it doesn't have that because we're not sufficiently subtly aware uh, of it, so it's almost immediately swamped by habitual modes of interpretation uh, and uh, impression. And we seize on to what we think is pleasurable and we desire it. We seize on to what we think is threatening and we dislike it. We seize on to what, or try to seize on to what is neutral and we're bored by it. Because um, boredom is, is actually a, a failure to find something to engage with. So there's nothing there that's interesting to us. So uh, our minds, our, our minds in this basic sense, are capable of very simply delivering us a, 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 um, an accurate, a true experience, which is undistorted. We're not saying, you know, e even, even, a, a, even a mirage, even the experience of water in the desert, which from a as it were, scientific optical point of view, isn't really there, is nonetheless, as an image, undistorted. It's true. Do you see what I mean? And sometimes you can sort of play with that. You can see... Um, uh, you, 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 I remember talking about this sort of thing in a, in a context where a light was coming through the window in such a way that it created a sort of rainbow-coloured ball just floating off the ground. There's a shiny... It's in India, so it's a shiny stone floor and a, a bright light coming through a window which was slightly, uh, the glass was not pure, so it was coming through and it created this ball which you could just see, it was there, hovering off the ground. And uh, from this point of view, well, that is what was there, if you see what I mean. You're not saying that it's ultimately true or that it's, it's really there from a material point of view or anything like that. You're saying that that experience is actually what uh, you experienced. It's undistorted uh, in, the, in the sense of not being distorted by your interpretation of it. But uh, we don't, we very rarely touch that mode of awareness, uh, that simple, pure, primary mode of awareness. And one of the things we, 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 we can be trying to, to develop in ourselves, especially through the practice of meditation, is the capacity to remain a little bit longer in that sort of pure awareness uh, before it, it distorts. Uh, and uh, we can thereby begin to notice the distortion as it takes place. And we can begin to understand that distortion. And especially what the, the Buddha says, that we understand that uh, that distortion leads to suffering, our suffering, probably somebody else's as well. But the way in which we distort uh, the primary moment of awareness uh, causes us to have a mistaken idea of what to do in relation to it and how to live on the basis of it, as it were, which then leads us to do things that cause us pain and suffering and probably cause others pain and suffering. So uh, we, we, particularly through meditation, we're training ourselves to take a step back from that distortive mode of experience. When you're meditating at all deeply, uh, your mind is removed from that sort of uh, distortion, at least temporarily. You're able to suspend that distortive process. I don't know whether distortive is a word, but let it be one. Um, you know what I mean. Um, it, it, the, 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 the automatic process that uh, just natural to us of selecting how we look at things in the world around us is suspended and we're, we're able to rest for a little while free from it free from its tyranny and uh, therefore to be happy uh, uh, it, 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 because when you're free from that sort of distortive uh, awareness well, you're just resting with what's there. There's nothing that's disturbing you. Uh, do you see what I mean? You're, you're, there's nothing to, to cause you pain. There's nothing to cause you worry. There's nothing to, do, to, to cause you to, to crave even. Uh, you're just resting with your experience uh, in, in the meditative absorbed state. 
And uh, you can experience, once you come out of that, for a little while, a, 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 a brief period, a brief interlude of freedom from that distortive, uh, um, aggressive almost, grasping onto the world. Uh, it's it said that the, 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 the mind is hungry for experience. It's hungry to seize onto experience for our own sake, for our own benefit. So what quickly comes on after we open our eyes and see is a grasping for something that we like, uh, an avoiding of what we dislike, and uh, a trying to find something stimulating when it's not very interesting. So we, we, uh, we try to rest for as long as we can simply with the, the raw basic experience. It's extremely difficult because the habit is so strong, which is why meditation is so necessary to us, to have this brief interlude. I think we also get this sort of interlude uh, in aesthetic experience of various kinds. For, for a little while you're lifted out of that appropriative consciousness. Um, uh, you know, if, if, you, uh, if you listen to music and your mind tries to grasp any particular combination of notes, you actually lose even the joy of those notes because the whole point of musical enjoyment is the sort of sense of, of a progression and uh, of, uh, of movement. Um, do you see what I mean? That, that you, 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 uh, if you try to seize a note and just go over it again and again, it just doesn't work. You know, you have favourite passages. I have favourite passages which I like to play again and again, but after a while they just don't work. You sort of have to listen to the whole piece and the way it builds up and the way it, it uh, flows. And if your mind grasps it at any point, you just lose it. Uh, it's the same with uh, enjoyment of, 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 of visual art, that um, if you try to seize it uh, and interpret it, You've lost it. Uh, you know, you particularly notice that when you're challenged by um, um, non-representative art, uh, when you're, uh, you know, so-called abstract art. Uh, you, you know, you get a, a Rothko with reds, and you try to decide, oh, that's a this or that's a that. It's like the famous, um, mon, um, what do you call it, collage done by um, uh, Matisse, which is called escargot, snails. He's having a joke. Um, <laughs> because our minds want to call it something. Uh, but it defies that. It invites us to something like this. It invites us to just a sort of pure awareness of what's there. Uh, that, I think, is, is what the, the greatest of art does. It's not, it's not telling us a story, uh, although it can do that, but the more it also doesn't tell a story, if you see what I mean, the more it lifts us out, the more the story is effective. I think I know what I mean. Uh, but uh, it, the, the, the greatest of art, and it doesn't have to be high art in, 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 in that sense, but something that really absorbs your attention, lifts you out of uh, the appropriative aspects of mind uh, into a, a, a sense of more pure uh, awareness, whether visual or through the hearing, or, or incense, for instance, can be like that. Um, you, you know, I remember Sangharachita, our teacher, saying that he used to, he and a group of friends used to have incense-smelling parties. <laughs> 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 There's something for a for an uh, evening at the LBC, an incense-smelling party. And he said, you, you just smell the incense and see what effect it has on you, uh, see what it evokes. Uh, because incense is very powerful, actually. And in fact, in the Mahayana Sutras, there's uh, a particular bodhisattva who teaches through smells, presumably nice ones, although maybe not always. <laughs> Sometimes a very nasty smell can be a pretty effective teaching tool. Um, but uh, <laughs> but, uh, but smells and, and sounds are, are particularly good because they're sort of they're narrative-free. Uh, you, you can't exactly interpret it's not so easy to interpret them but they take us into a more pure uh, sensing so we become closer to pure awareness awareness that is pure of distortion undistorted moment of awareness 
And then we can begin to see the way in which our habitual uh, self-attachment, we'll talk more about self-attachment tomorrow, you'll be glad to hear, and if, just to give you the clue in advance, I'm a guinit. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, it, it self-attachment comes in uh, and interprets that pure moment of awareness in terms of me. You know, it all comes down to me in the end. What is, I think, going to be nice for me? What I think is going to be nasty for me? What I think is just boring? And uh, uh, then I stop experiencing just what's there. I experience this distorted image that I've created, a one-sided distorted image which picks out just that side that appeals to or repels me or just doesn't interest me and I dismiss that. You know that can be the case with people. You, you meet somebody and you just find them boring. Um, it does happen doesn't it? You're not interested in them and then a bit later you find out something about them and you find that actually they've got a very rich inner life that they're really interesting people. You feel so ashamed. Uh, or you sometimes think somebody's really fascinating and wonderful, the most beautiful girl in the world. And uh, then you find, well, she's just an ordinary nice girl, but just ordinary. You see what I mean. Take your point, choose your poison, whatever turns you on. But um, um, uh, we distort our experience in the light of our self-attachment, habitual self-attachment that... Uh, is, is sort of operating in a conditioned process kind of behind all this that comes in on top of it all and distorts it, changes it so that it uh, becomes all about me uh, rather than simply seeing what is. So uh, we'll, we'll experiment a bit with this in the, in the, in the meditation tomorrow. I'll, 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 I'll sort of assume that we've been here <laughs> For this, and if you're here for the meditation at five o'clock, we'll just explore a little bit, playing with this um, uh, this boundary between that primary moment of awareness and its distortion, because it's probably for us as as important to notice the distortion as it is the primary moment, because we need to learn how we habitually, conditionedly distort. We, we, all of us, whatever our background or culture or, or uh, conditioning or training or whatever, it, it's natural to us. It, it's what we've been doing, and according to Buddhist tradition, since beginningless time. We've been distorting our experience. We're born with the innate tendency to distort um, what are called the anusaya, which means latent tendency. Uh, so the latent tendencies are the tendencies to greed, hatred, delusion, doubt, uh, wrong view, uh, etc. All based around the, the latent tendency to self-infatuation, self-attachment, what it's called. Uh, um, uh, 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 self-ignorance, you don't really know what you are, but you think you do. A self-view, you think you do. Uh, self-infatuation uh, and uh, uh, self-pride these underlying tendencies that then seize onto that absolutely innocent moment of awareness. That, and that, if that innocent moment which is full of joy and full of, of, of extraordinary possibility, uh, extraordinary richness, uh, we lose because we pass into this uh, distorted image of the world. The Buddha said famously that all... Uh, 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 ordinary people, Th Prathajanas is the uh, Pali word, Sanskrit word, Prathajana in Pali, uh, which is an, an ordinary unenlightened person, you and me, brothers and sisters, uh, ordinary unenlightened enlightened individuals, are mad, the Buddha said. <laughs> We're all mad because we distort what is, uh, and what is plain as the nose on your face. Uh, because it's presented to us absolutely plain with each moment of awareness. So this is a bit of a nutshell uh, um, epitome. You could take it from another point of view as to what mind is, uh, awareness is. Awareness in the first place presents us with 
uh, a, a pure moment. But then it's distorted by self-attachment and by habitual uh, responses which subtly change it, not so subtly change it as well, and then lead to uh, suffering for us an unskillful behaviour. All unskillful behaviour is based on a distorted uh, image of the world. Uh, we're misinterpreting what's going on. We think it's like this. And you can see that in the current situation. If, if what we're hearing is correct, and I no longer believe anything I'm told, but if we, uh, you know, we hear what the Western press is saying about NATO and it's just defending, etc., and you hear what uh, Putin and the Russians say, they're just defending, and it's all distortion. And this distortion, two sets of distortions clash with huge suffering, huge suffering. And it's going on all the time. It's the basis of, of suffering. The basis of suffering is this distorted awareness. And our job as Buddhists, uh, uh, if you are one, even if you're not, it's still your job, I'm giving it to you. <laughs> our job is to help people to, uh, to, to get a, 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 a nearer to the way things really are, to come down to that pure moment of awareness. And of course, the first task we have is to get closer to it ourselves. So that'll do for today. Tomorrow, we'll learn more about what that pure moment of awareness is, a, is like and what... Um, what uh, uh, um, this, this tendency to form a self and a, a, a self-attachment is like and what it's like to be free of it. So we'll look at, uh, at mind from that point of view, what a moment of awareness is like that is free from self-attachment uh, um, self in terms of its relationship to others and the world around us, um, what is known as bodhicitta. But we'll talk more about that tomorrow. Um, so please do come back. Otherwise, you'll just be left uh, <laughs> with pure annoyance. That, that's not a bad thing to be left with. Uh, <laughs> after all, what happened to Bahir of the Bark Garment? Bahir of the Bark Gar Garment heard the Buddha's teaching in the scene, only the scene, in the herd, only the herd. Then there will be no thereby, thereafter. In other words, all of that stuff. And he gained enlightenment. He was free. And a little while later, he was run over by a, 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 a bullock. <laughs> he was dead. <laughs> Just in time, eh? Um, uh, so you get a different perspective on his sense of urgency. Seems to happen a few times, bullocks running. And it's very interesting. I, I go to India a lot, and people are very wary of bullocks um, because they can run amok. Uh, so I know of two or three um, people in the Pali Canon who are run over by bullocks. But anyway, the point with Bahia of the Bark Garment was he clearly knew he had this moment to get free. That was his sense of urgency. Uh, but he made it. He made it just in time. So, brothers and sisters, there may not be bullocks out there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>